Hello again, everybody. We're going to continue our discussion here about the uh, intrinsic renal diseases, and we're going to talk about the tubulointerstitial disorders, which are disorders that affect the interstitial tissue of the kidney or the tubules of the nephron themselves. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates and notifications every time I put a new video up. Okay, so tubulo interstitial disease. It's a mouthful, right? This is, like I said, a disease of either the renal tubules or the interstitium. And this is separate from the glomerular diseases, where the problem is, of course, in the glomerulus. And we're going to see uh, how these differences come into play and how there are some similarities. The tubules are responsible for concentrating the urine. So suffice it to say that if you have a tubular disease, then you are going to have a more dilute urine because remember that the tubules are not only responsible for pulling electrolytes back into the circulation, particularly sodium, uh, but also responsible for pulling water back in. When you're dehydrated, that's very, very important because the filtrate doesn't really care how dehydrated you are. It's a matter of reabsorbing in the tubules. That's what's going to keep your volume status up. The key findings with uh, the tubulo interstitial diseases, particularly the uh, tubular diseases, are muddy brown casts. And they have a particular appearance that's different from the red blood cell casts that we saw in the uh, glomerular diseases. So unlike the glomerular disorders, hematuria and proteinuria are rare. You can have a little bit of hematuria, a little bit of proteinuria, but you're certainly not going to have nephrotic range proteinuria like you do in many of the glomerular diseases. Like I said, there's a reduction of tubular function uh, or there may be interstitial disease, both of which will result in an impaired resorptive capacity. You can also get something called isostenuria. That's where the urine osmolality is roughly the same as the serum osmolality, and this is a very important finding. Unlike in the glomerular diseases, renal biopsy is never used for diagnosing tubulo interstitial diseases, so that is the wrong answer. This is the basic workup for renal failure. Notice here that we are getting a CMP. That's because that includes calcium. It includes liver function tests. Those are going to be important for these TI diseases. Um, so we want our routine labs, CBC, BMP, and also the magnesium. Those are all our, our uh, markers of whether we've got inflammation or infection, as well as our electrolytes. We want a urinalysis for obvious reasons. We want a microscopic analysis looking for calcium. We want urine, sodium, and potassium, and then a renal ultrasound. So what we're doing is we're looking for signs of inflammation. We're looking at electrolytes. We're doing a whole nice workup of the urine, and then we want to take a look at the kidneys. Okay, so this here is a red blood cell cast. And this is what we would expect to see in a glomerular disease because red blood cells are getting out of the, or into the glomerulus from the uh, arterioles and they can't get out of the, or they can't uh, be reabsorbed. You don't reabsorb red blood cells or protein. So all of that is going to get into the uh, nephron and it's not gonna come back. Now this here is a muddy brown cast. You can see how it's a little bit more granular in appearance compared to the uh, red blood cell cast. So this is a muddy brown cast. And if you see a muddy brown cast, um, then you know you're dealing with a tubular disease. So our general workup here, uh, like I said, you get a urinalysis, you'll see muddy brown casts, low osmolality, BMP or CMP, you'll see azotemia, the BU and creatinine ratio is going to be about 10 to 1 as opposed to much higher than that, 20 to 1 or more, which we would see in pre-renal disease. Hyperkalemia is very common uh, because you... Uh, 
because the kidney is responsible for getting rid of potassium. We usually have an excess. Um, so if you have a very high potassium, make sure and get an EKG. CBC will be variable depending on which tubular interstitial disease we're working with. 24-hour urine protein will be roughly normal because this is not a glomerular disease. Sed rate should be about normal, and the C3 should be about normal. Okay, now these are the indications for dialysis. We certainly don't need to do this with all of these, but you should be familiar with some of the uh, indications. If you have a severe acidosis, pH less than 7.1. If you have an electrolyte abnormality, particularly hyperkalemia with EKG changes, that's urgent to get uh, that potassium out, so you would dialyze in that case. Intoxications, we're not really talking about that here, but certainly patients who, um, intoxicate on uh, methanol or something like that, ethylene glycol, uh, fluid overload, severe fluid overload really, and uremic symptoms. This is not just azotemia, this is severe azotemia that causes symptoms and thus uremia. So we're looking at things like pericarditis, encephalopathy, and platelet dysfunction. Okay, here's the tubulointerstitial diseases. You can see how they compare to the glomerular disorders. All right, so we're going to talk about quite a few, but I'm going to kind of run through these pretty quickly because um, not all of these are particularly high yield. ATN is due to ischemic or nephrotoxic insult to renal tubular epithelial cells. There's a number of mechanisms by which this can happen, but basically you have dysfunction and detachment of the tubular cells from the basement membrane. And remember, the tubular cells have all those channels that are responsible for reabsorbing electrolytes. So that's why you don't get the proper reabsorption. And for that matter, reabsorption of water. Uh, like all renal failure, you can get azotemia. If it's severe enough, you can get uremia. Uh, for diagnosis, urinalysis is the best first step. Remember, that's part of your workup for renal failure. Remember, in many instances, you may not have symptoms of renal failure. You may not notice it until you get a BUN creatinine and see the creatinine rise over time. Um, so your next step then would to get a urinalysis, but also to get all those other tests that we mentioned, so getting a serum magnesium and a serum calcium and a renal ultrasound. In ATN, your analysis shows muddy brown casts. There's no specific treatment aside from maintaining the fluid status, electrolytes, and acid base status. You can admit these patients for observation, particularly if their electrolytes are severely deranged and dialysis may be used if needed. These are muddy brown casts. Allergic interstitial nephritis, there's many causes, usually it's drugs, so you can remember ABCQRS, allopurinol, penicillin, penicillin, cephalosporins, quinolones, rifampin, and sulfa drugs. So you can see a lot of antibiotics. Uh, infections can cause it, as well as certain autoimmune disorders. Uh, these symptoms and the presentation are very similar to ATN. Uh, however, these patients may have more systemic features, fever, arthralgias, and a rash, particularly after a medication. This can come on immediately. Um, usually, you'll suspect this based on incidental findings on BMP, but you can also notice it on CBC uh, where you would see a peripheral eosinophilia. That's kind of a giveaway. Urinalysis, again, is the best test. Um, what you'll see here is a sterile pyuria. Remember here we have an inflammation, so we would expect to see white blood cells in the urine. Uh, you can see muddy brown casts, and occasionally you can see proteinuria here. The treatment is to stop the offending agent. Toxin-mediated renal insufficiency can be from things like drugs and contrast. So drugs here, this is different from an allergic reaction. This is directly toxic to the uh, cells. Um, often it's from an accumulative effect of drugs. So this is uh, more delayed compared to uh, allergic interstitial nephritis. There are a variety of drugs that can do this. Um, they can get uremic symptoms with long-term therapy. However, what's going to separate this from AIN is that it comes on over a longer period of time and they're not gonna have a fever and they're not gonna have a rash because this is not allergic. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. You've got to look at the history and find the toxin. And the treatment, again, here is to 
discontinue the offending agent. There are things that we can do to try to prevent this with aminoglycosides in particular. We want to consult pharmacy and get those uh, dosages spaced out. Uh, and then for contrast, we generally prehydrate them. We can add uh, N-acetylcysteine. However, there is evidence showing that N-acetylcysteine doesn't really help too much. Now with contrast, the way that this works is that it causes a vasospasm of the afferent arterial. This can start therefore with a pre-renal picture and then evolve into an ischemic or tubular interstitial picture. Um, we try to avoid contrast in older patients and diabetic patients or anyone with um, any degree of renal insufficiency. And like I said, IV hydration will go a long way in reducing the risk of this happening. Atheroembolic disease of the kidney is not commonly tested. However, this is usually due to cholesterol crystals that break free from plaques. So look for this to happen after angiography. Somebody comes in with a heart attack, you get an angiogram, uh, maybe do some stenting, and then a day later, two days later, they end up with renal failure. Um, th so therefore, there's an increased risk with atherosclerotic disease, with aortic aneurysm, and with renal artery stenosis. Um, so look for vascular issues and, um, and angiography. Symptoms here are pretty much all the same. However, they can have some uh, abnormal rashes, this bluish, bluish discoloration. They can get uh, cyanosis of the digits, and they can get livido reticularis, which is that modeling, and I have a picture of that. Diagnosis here is clinical. Look for those skin manifestations. The treatment is supportive, and discontinue any anticoagulants that they may be on, at least temporarily. This is livido reticularis. So you see it once, you'll always know what this looks like. You can see it's on their arms, it's on their legs, and so forth. Here's another very obvious case here. This is a little less obvious. So uh, this kind of modeling can happen in anyone, but if you've got a patient with renal failure and you see this, um, you definitely need to think of an atheroembolic process. Pigment-mediated renal insufficiency either comes from myoglobin or hemoglobin. If it's myoglobin, it's typically from rhabdomyolysis. If it's hemoglobin, it's usually from a severe hemolysis. These pigments are directly toxic to the tubules, and so this can cause destruction or it can cause obstruction. So you can get... Uh, this can come at you in two ways. So look for a history of one of these things. For rhabdomyolysis, which I'm going to talk about here, this usually follows a crush injury or seizures. It can also follow uh, drugs that can reduce blood flow to the muscles. Uh, these patients will have very dark urine and uh, a renal failure. Um, in that case, you may confuse this with pre-renal failure, but look at your labs. CBC may show a low hemoglobin, DMP shows a hyperkalemia, magnesium and calcium. You can have a hypermagnesemia and a hypocalcemia. That's due uh, in many cases uh, to hemolysis. Creatine kinase, particularly in rhabdomyolysis, you won't see this in hemolysis, uh, you would have a very high creatine kinase because of muscle breakdown. Urinalysis, you will not see red blood cells here. Urine dipstick will be positive for blood. However, you will not visualize red blood cells in the uh, microscopy. So that's kind of the giveaway. You get a dipstick positive for blood, you look at it under a microscope and you see no red blood cells. That's because that dipstick checks for hemoglobin and myoglobin will react with the dipstick as well, but there's no whole red blood cells. And then the urine myoglobin will be positive in rhabdomyolysis. We admit these patients, and here again, I'm talking about rhabdo here. Um, so. A patient with rhabdo, you're going to admit them for close monitoring. You really want to hydrate these patients up. It flushes the kidneys. Closely monitor the electrolytes. I would say get every four to eight hours. You want to check their uh, sodium, potassium, magnesium. Continuous EKG monitoring because uh, the high potassium can cause dysrhythmia. And if there is an elevated potassium with EKG changes, remember we're looking at those peaked T waves that comes with hyperkalemia. We'll administer calcium gluconate and consider dialysis. Renal insufficiency secondary to multiple myeloma or Benz-Jones proteins is um, exactly what it sounds like. It causes tubular damage. These patients will, of course, have features of multiple myeloma. Uh, you should know what those are. Um, the, uh, on diagnosis, what you're going to see uh, is a uh, 
is, is a urinalysis that does not show protein, but a dipstick that does. So the urinalysis does not detect Bentz Jones protein, but the dipstick will detect protein in the urine. So it's kind of similar to the uh, myoglobinuria that we see in rhabdomyolysis, kind of same, same idea going on. If you have a patient with symptoms of multiple myeloma um, and uh, this renal insufficiency and they're not diagnosed with multiple myeloma, remember the best step to diagnose multiple myeloma is an SPEP, serum protein electrophoresis. We manage this with observation, treat the underlying cause. There's another uh, pathologic process called light chain deposition disease. This is very similar, but it is seen in patients without multiple myeloma. Crystal mediated renal insufficiency is due to stones. Uh, this is uh, this this can cause renal insufficiency, but usually uh, it doesn't because you would need to have it in both ureters. Uh, so there are two types of stones that commonly do this. Oxalate stones is usually caused by ingestion of ethylene glycol. So look for a patient with a psychiatric history. It can also be caused by irritable or sorry inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and uh, really though, it can be caused by any significant inflammation or malabsorption in the intestine. And the reason is what, what happens is uh, you have excess fat in the intestines and that binds to calcium. And calcium ordinarily binds to oxalate. And so if you bind to calcium, uh, the fat binds to calcium, oxalate will then be reabsorbed because it's free oxalate. It's reabsorbed, you have excess oxalate making it to the kidneys and that is going to cause stones if it gets, uh, if it gets saturated enough. Symptoms are pretty much gonna be the same. Look for colicky flank pain if they're passing a stone, if it's in the ureter. In a patient with ethylene glycol poisoning, you may see an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. Remember your mud piles mnemonic. Uh, the diagnosis here is based on history. Uh, you've got to get a urinalysis with microscopy. Um, you may see stones or you, need, you may need to have these patients strain their urine to find the stone to know what cause it is. Uh, however, in many instances, uh, based on the clinical history, you're probably going to know which, uh, which kind of stone you're dealing with. The treatment here is hydration. For oxalate stones caused by ethylene glycol intoxication, we want to reduce the uh, amount of oxalate that is formed. And we do that by inhibiting alcohol dehydrogenase. We can come at that with IV ethanol or IV fomepazole, usually we use fomepazole, um, and then dialysis. For urate stones, again, this is usually caused by tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, look for, uh, use allopurinol and resbiracase. And I didn't mention uh, urate stones, uh, that's usually due to tumor lysis syndrome. Um, and these are diamond shaped crystals. And I have a picture of that. So here's calcium oxalate stones. They're classically envelope shaped, although they may be a little more square. Um, so look for that kind of X shape in the middle. And then you may see them in this form too, these dumbbell shapes. So you can see both here. These are urate stones, they're typically diamond shaped, um, but they can kind of be square too. Okay, so uh, when we're using uh, IV ethanol or fomepazole, what we're doing is we're blocking that enzyme here. And notice um, that this is good both for methanol toxicity, which does not really cause renal issues, and ethylene glycol, which does. Notice that ethylene glycol, as it's metabolized by ordinary enzymes, um, you end up with oxalic acid. And so we can prevent that from happening by inhibiting that initial enzyme. Renal insufficiency secondary to hypercalcemia is usually due to hyperparathyroidism, but if this is due to anything that causes very high calcium in the blood. Look for things like thiazide diuretics can cause a hypercalcemia, lithium can do it, granulomatous disease, so sarcoidosis, TB, histoplasmosis, beryliosis, I'm kind of going down uh, the list here of, of how common these are. Symptoms all gonna be the same. However, you may see manifestations of hypercalcemia. Remember stones, bones, moans, and psychiatric overtones. Diagnosis here, um, again, it's very difficult to uh, separate these without labs. Um, but if you do get a urinalysis, you may be able to see some stones if they're small enough um, to pass. Uh, so uh, what you see is wedge-shaped prisms here. 
Um, if the patient does have calcium phosphate stones, you absolutely need to work them up for hyperparathyroidism. So get a serum calcium and PTH levels. We would expect to see in uh, primary hyperthyroid hyperparathyroidism, an elevated calcium and an elevated PTH. Uh, you can confirm this with the Sestamibi scan and then refer these patients to surgery. This is the, uh, the calcium phosphate stone. So you can see these wedge-shaped crystals. Renal papillary necrosis is an ischemic necrosis of the renal papillae or of the entire pyramid. There's a number of things that can cause this. I had somebody in one of my previous videos ask why I got a urinalysis on a patient with sickle cell disease. This is why. Okay, so we always want to monitor renal function in patients with sickle cell disease. So analgesic nephropathy, sickle cell nephropathy, diabetic nephropathy, NSAID-induced nephropathy, you can see that pretty much anything that causes kidney disease can lead to renal papillary necrosis. The hallmark is pyelonephritis. Um, so this is going to appear similar to a UTI with flank pain and stuff like that. The diagnosis here, though, is really clued in with the urinalysis. You'll see a sterile pyuria. And with uh, pile, ordinary uh, infectious pyelonephritis, we would see white blood cells and a positive nitrites and esterase. Uh, CT urography is really useful to confirm the diagnosis. The treatment here is to stop the offending agent if there is one. Otherwise, there's really no specific therapy, and we treat these patients supportively. So here's just a recap of everything we talked about, and I've got two slides here.